We are and now we are live. So good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are based. It's a pleasure to have you here again with another of the webinar organized by us, Shitsexar. And this time we have actually a great guest, the team from Bed VR, who is gonna tell us about the view uh, about um, visualizing data in virtual reality or in general in in immersive medium and uh, and of course as usual i really encourage you guys to to ask questions but before we go into this why don't we maybe give a little bit of opportunity to the team actually to introduce uh to introduce you guys so jack susie enoch it's a pleasure really to to have you here thanks so much for having us it's been a pleasure to you know work with you and to use shapes it's an amazing tool so we're really honored to be here so Jad Miyushi, uh, CTO of Bad VR, and I'm more on the technical side. So I'm writing a lot of code every day, and I'm looking at designs and critiquing them and figuring out how these things translate into a product. And that's and, sort of my background. Yeah, I'm Susie. I'm Suzanne Borders, is CEO and co-founder of Bad VR. Um, definitely, uh, Shapes is close to my heart. I'm a former UX designer, so uh, we've definitely been looking for a tool that is to help us with, you know, spatial design still a relatively new medium, especially when you're talking about the UX UI design aspect of it. Um, but to give a little bit of greater context about Bad VR, the company, uh, we've been around since 2018. Our primary focus is on um, the democratizing insight, using immersive technology and the spatialization of data to make the discovery of insights within the world's data sets faster, easier, and more universally accessible to everyone. So an important part of that process are having you know, interfaces for the data or the display for the data that really is um, accessible and understandable by everyone who puts on a headset. So as hard as UX design can be for 2D screens, we have an additional challenge designing for multidimensional spaces. Um, and it's a really crucial part of our business and a really cr crucial part of our overall mission and vision for bad VR. So um, it's definitely, you know, been searching for a tool like Shapes XR to make that process easier. And I appreciate, um, you know, being here. And then we have uh, Enoch, who yep. is on our team as well. Let him go ahead and introduce himself. Yeah, I'm, I'm Enoch. I do uh, I do some of the coding. I kind of shift over. I do some coding and then I shift over and do some design work. So I've been working a lot with them. Um, with the team doing shapes work and um it's been a great process to go through and guys it's a pleasure to have you here and like you, i see that you all you mentioned like design and experiences that's something that is it's really valuable especially in this world that tends to be sometimes kind of like driven by developers that's great and on the other hand i also want to share a bit of like i, I do love data i mean i've uh, i've I've done my PhD, like a lot of analysis in this case was in biotech. So I've done microarray uh, and, and uh, me uh, metabolomics. So I, I would just imagine how much value it would add to see something that is so complex to understand on, on a 2D surface and you could actually touch it, manipulate it, and in general, like have a different view. And as you guys mentioned, really step in the data, right? So uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here. And I see people start jumping in. I see that uh, Sivan Puvar, thanks for uh, having us. Thanks you for tuning in, uh, Sivan. Uh, we do have more uh, Savas Contos. Nice to be here. And I, guys, I mean, I'm actually based in the Netherlands. Where are you based? Uh, maybe just type us in, uh, Jack. And I'm in California. Yeah, California then for, for you guys. And Enoch, well, what about you? I'm based in Missouri. It's real cold right now. <laughs> okay. Here, here is actually rained the whole day and it was like cold. And I, I'm not sure if I would prefer snow, much more snow. Or, or well, it's cold. actually been cold in Los Angeles, i.e. it's been like 50 degrees and it's been really, really windy. Um, mm -hmm. Like so cold that I wore a scarf mm -hmm. and a hat today. So cold on a California scale, not cold on a Missouri scale. <laughs> Missouri. Yes, yes. It's That's all a right. matter of perspective. <laughs> So uh, we have some uh, in Berdat in India. It's probably very late there. So thanks, uh, Manish, for joining in. Uh, all right, from Nigeria. Uh, then we do have UIS Nashville, Jared, uh, ARVR engineer. Uh, greeting from LA, from Rick. Uh, and we also do have XR Story, based in Sweden. Awesome. <laughs> uh, Robert, in this case. Really Robert, I love it. <laughs> so uh, the idea for today is to learn about what uh, 
a bit a little bit more about the topic of data in this new immersive in, in immersive uh immersive medium look at maybe how you guys have for example designed and uh, developed and the choices that you have made throughout the the development process of one of your product uh and then get that conversation going where we will actually step in shapes and you can guide us through some of the steps and decisions that you have made um and then ultimately also know if that we, we decide we always try to focus on one specific topic so that we can provide a lot of value for people listening uh, but in general i know that this is not the only one the only product you have worked on so we're going to look at maybe some others that you uh, you uh, you built and maybe you can tell us a little of what's coming uh, in the pipeline and of course in all this um I encourage everybody to keep asking questions. So I'm going to start with mine, but as everybody joins here, not sure if you're joining for the first time, but your question always have priority over mine. So please go ahead because that's really how we want the conversation going. Uh, and by the way, there are more people from uh, Bus from New Jersey, uh, Luis uh, from Mexico, uh, Athens, uh, Savas Contos. Uh, so, uh, and we have also Jared. Funnily enough, I'm part of the data science team. So this is quite the interesting convergence for me. Well, here you go. Not by chance. I think you're in the right place, Jared, for tonight. So let me start with my first question. So um, we are usually used to look at data on a 2D surface, right? And you need to bring it in space. So, and it's not just about in 3D, right? It's also about space. It's also about localization of those data uh, sometimes on an actual environment. How do you tackle that? How do you do it? Well, I think it's important, first of all, to realize that the data started in 3D. This is true. It didn't start on a flat screen. You don't necessarily think about approaching you know, well, I'm gonna take data from one flat screen into another, you're probably thinking about data in the world in a three-dimensional environment, maybe across time, maybe across other types of dimensions as well. So it's almost like you're taking data from many, many, many dimensions and then compressing it down into three or two dimensions and then trying to fit it onto a tiny little screen. It's kind of like running around yeah. with, you know, with a telescope. And everything that you look at, you can only see one little view and you're looking really, really close up. And so and another challenge with those two dimensional visualizations is, you know, when you have a really, really large data set, you're only ever able to view them, the micro or the macro, but not both the, the micro and the macro simultaneously. There's always this trade off. Every layer that you drill into the data, you lose the greater context of the data. And that's right. you know something that's just inherent in the way that, you know, two dimensional data displays have been forever, but something that obviously can be overcome. Uh, in a dramatic way with AR and VR technology, but sorry to interrupt you, Jack. Go yeah, no, it's going to say you can take off the telescope and then you <laughs> see the big view, but you can put it on and you see the, the little view. And it's almost like you have to have all these different, you know, lenses to look at the world when really what you're trying to do is just extract from the world certain patterns and features. So we have a bit of a different approach to all of this, which number one is when we're attempting to understand how to paint these pictures or how to represent we sort of start with a three-dimensional environment and then we go in with the three-dimensional drawing tool. And I, that's a really critical part of this is that if you're looking at a piece of paper and trying to draw, what would this look like? You're already flattening it. You're already flattening the world. So we, we try to have in both AR and VR, we try to have this three-dimensional representation of the world that we start with. And then we annotate in that and we're building in 3D and drawing in 3D and looking at different things. Now, to be fair, a big part of our research process is watching science fiction movies like Iron Man, Minority Report, Avatar. So you'll see little flavors of that in all of that. That's not research. That's not research yeah. part of it. <laughs> Very difficult, you know, it's studious research watching these movies. Um, but we're looking not just at how the interfaces are designed. We're also looking at how the the people, the actors, the characters interact with these interfaces. You know, are, are the interfaces reacting really smoothly to their hand motions? Is it reacting to their change of focus? Uh, is it a fully interactive thing? Are they controlling something, you know, displaying out against a large area? Are they doing very fine precision work? So we're looking at 
not just output, but also input. Are they using their hands? Are they using controllers, you know, control surfaces, panels? So these are all the, the raw ingredients that go into the process of figuring out how to represent information. And one, one other tactic we like to do, or one other, uh, I guess, thought experiment is, and we'll leave you with this to answer this question, which is if you were to imagine your LinkedIn network or your Facebook social network, imagine all the people that you know and all the people that they know and all the people that they know. And if you try to picture that in your mind, is that a pie chart? Is that a bar graph? No. Network really it, like it. Exactly. You've got this 3D thing with lines shooting out and lots of people. And it's that representation, that mental model that we are building into a virtual environment. Right. And a lot of people think when they think inherently of data visualization in AR and VR, their mind immediately goes to this concept of three-dimensional charts and graphs or a 3D scatter plot or something. I've seen so, like I've seen so often. It's you know, like you see the yeah. graph and then you see some, some bar graph. It's okay, what are we doing here? Why am I even here? <laughs> right. You know, and, and to be fair, I'm, I'm sure there's a small amount of added value in being able to like actually walk around that versus seeing a three-dimensional bar chart, for instance, or scatter plot on a 2D screen. But like to really utilize the value added uh, in of AR and VR technology, you really have to fundamentally go back to the drawing board with how you plan to display that data. Because yeah. charts and graphs are really great, you know, for 2D screens. And they were really great when the data sets were smaller. But, you know, if you're going to make the effort and ask people to put on a headset and ask people to engage with a new technology, the display has to have a tremendous you know, additional, at, value. finding additional value, right? So that's right. what we try to do is really just get rid of these sort of standards that have been used in two dimensions and really try to find the better, the best new ways of, of displaying this data multidimensionally using AR and VR technology. So like visualizations that you've never seen before, maybe you have seen it in a movie, um, you know, but it just hasn't and this, reality. And this, I do have a question because uh, it's, it's interesting. You said that you use fiction to inform design. Right. Yeah. Uh, have you tried? Uh, I mean, were there ever cases in which you use reality to inform this? Yes. I mean, because yeah. VR is embodied, right? So yes. we do and manipulate things continuously. Can you just give us an example in which you ported yeah. a real manipulation into data visualization? I actually have a really good example of this. Um, so we were working with a really large data set that was abstract, that didn't have a geospatial tie-in. Some data sets do, some data sets don't. Um, and I was trying to find a way to display, I believe it was something like a million data points around an individual, like how visually to display that. And obviously we would allow the individual to work through and navigate and filter and all of that. But the initial display of a million data points, how do you do that in an organized fashion that the human brain can really ingest that much information? And I thought back to, so I actually went to the World Cup, um, I believe it was in 2017, it was in Moscow and Russia. And that was the largest um, amount of human beings, individual human beings that I'd ever seen in one physical place at any given time. I believe that stadium housed something like 89,000 people um, to watch the games. So my mind went to that concept of a real world stadium because that was the largest amount of individual items, I guess, or people that I had ever seen organized in a fashion that allowed me to exist within that stadium and understand how to categorize, like I could easily look out and say, okay, those are these are all the French fans. Here are all the Dutch fans, because the game that I saw was France versus uh, the Netherlands, I believe, I believe. Um, anyways, doesn't matter, but that's using that real world design. So eventually what we did is we came up with the concept of a data stadium, where you're basically displaying all of these individual data points in stadium format. So you're able to easily see in sections and categories look at trends on that macro level, but then also pull out each section and drill down to the individual and see the individual data points as well. But right. yeah. By the way, for the people that are listening, we, we also have some video after, so we're not going to let, let you <laughs> imagine things. You're going to step in, as, as, as we said. So uh, let, don't, don't be frightened. We do have some visual to support, uh, to support this, this, this story. And 
if so bass is saying was the crowd orange because if it was orange it was probably holland <laughs> i believe so i believe so all that i remember is because i was sitting in a french section and the french were like going crazy and i i enjoy sports um i'm not a huge soccer or football fan so i don't really know that game in particular too well but i'm a fan of excellence like anything that's performed at an elite excellent level so i'm always like curious and interested and i actually got like i won free tickets so you know but so yeah for, for me my overwhelming memory was a bunch of like really angry french people because i believe colin might won the game and then Top after right. getting the stadium there were like fights out in the metro and stuff so i don't know I, got lost, I think did our camera die we'll, here we'll fix it just give us a second give no it, problem. i apologize so uh, be, before we, we, we go, there is a question that I had. So, I mean, that data are renowned to be tricky and dirty, right? <laughs> In a sense, right? It's, so it, it's sometimes very tricky to, to get and clean and get something that you can actually uh, visualize properly. So is, is there any difference uh, in the in the process of um, doing that refinement of the data source of the backend in order to visualize those data in VR compared to a uh, uh, 2D uh, um, interface? Sorry, one second here. No problem. And maybe this is a great this is a great moment to remind everybody to actually ask questions because this is a very unique opportunity. If you have ever, uh, um, uh, oh, uh, by the way, uh, what are you using? Okay, let's go with a question. I've seen just right now from uh, Pascal McGuire, he's saying, fantastic chat question. Are you using OODA as a principle to design UI in VR? Question, from Pascal, can you also articulate what OODA means? I don't know if you guys are aware of it. I'm not familiar with no. it. So, Pascal, while we go to the next question, can you maybe spell out what OODA stands for? And then I'm going to get the question. But we have another one from Excel Story. Did you do take some inspiration from nature, like ocean, uh, with fishes, forests, ants, neurons? Oh, definitely. That's The answer to that question is definitely yes, 100%. There's a lot of organic design um, that makes a lot of sense when you start looking at it, whether that be like a spider's web or whether that be neurons is a huge one, actually, especially when designing network interfaces. Um, I, I personally believe there's a lot of like a lot of uh, intelligence behind the way that nature works and the way that nature sort of interacts with itself. Uh, and then also, of course, you have like, you know, the golden ratio and like nature, things observe that you can observe in nature and learn from for sure um, and apply in design. I think you would be especially because the nature of AR and VR design is so um, inherently multidimensional, taking inspiration from the world, which is also multidimensional, it makes total sense. Um, less sense when you're designing for 2D, because you really have to condense things down. But what I've really, really enjoyed and embraced about designing in 3D is that you can use these like real world uh, inspirations and forms in a really authentic way. Um, and they, they're very valuable too. I found that they've worked very well. And it's an interesting comment about ants because they are, this is a, uh, you know, these are interactive in some respects, uh, animals or, 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 you know, organisms that congregate, that separate, that categorize and group themselves and watching their behavior and understanding a little bit about what drives the behavior, but they're, they're motivated, they're moving and dynamic. They, you can see millions of them at once. So these patterns can start to emerge. So even just from a super purely superficial standpoint, watching giant masses of ants doing things, you see that there is movement and methodology and patterns and, and, patterns and, and motivations. And uh, so looking both at visual and at sort of behavioral interaction, how they move around things and move with things and, and move the things themselves, they'll, they'll manipulate their environment also, as well as building on top of it and adding to it. So this, this dynamicness of the environment is important and an important concept in uh, virtual design as well, which is that you're not just creating an environment, but you're shaping it as you go and rearranging it and right, changing right. the layout. And meanwhile, I'm getting questions pouring in. So guys, amazing. Let's get, uh, I've got at least three, three more and they keep coming. So uh, are you predefining algorithm to random data in 3D or do we allow users to create their own? 
I mean, how much power do you give to the people that use your app, for example, as I interpret the question? It's both, really. So there, there are predefined mechanisms for how to map different types of data sets into this environment. But there are also, that's a language in some respect. And so opening that language, opening that architecture to allow people to experiment and try different mappings and even try one of the things that we're going to be showing and talking about in the future, uh, the not so distant future is input devices and, and how to connect peripherals, smartwatches, phones, devices, you know, control panels, uh, how to provide that input into the system and how to map data control to those inputs as well. So the short answer to this is yes, we want this to become the beginning of a conversation about defining those algorithms, sharing them, and allowing people to contribute to them and, and add on top of what we provide, but we have to provide some foundation of it. Right, right, right. And uh, I mean, I think I was thinking of keeping this for the last, but I think right now we have been talking, we haven't given anything to people besides, of course, a lot of great answer, by the way, don't get me wrong. But uh, Gwendale is asking, can we see some example of your work either in actual VR or a video? Yes. The question is, both actually so first i'm gonna tell some video that i have right now um uh, of some of the work and maybe uh, you guys can can talk over it and then we can actually also go in vr to show some of their design some of their process so Gwendal, thanks for asking i was thinking of keeping up for the for the end but as i said my plan don't matter you guys matter most so let me share the video with you guys and here we go so what we're looking at here is terrain map with drone data that's feeding into some uh, very simple points of interest over the map. There's uh, Here we're looking at uh, wireless radio spectrum where the radio signals are overlaid into reality and then we're controlling a little bit of how we uh, explore that data set and this is a conference room environment. So we're effectively looking at what is the Wi-Fi signal strength in that conference room. Here we're looking at a little miniature data stadium. Um, here we've got some uh, some weather data that we're looking at, which is three-dimensional weather data. Next and, data. and we've yeah. got it mapped into this three-dimensional city. And so we're watching this traje the trajectory of this uh, weather as it's striking a, a city. And we're controlling the trajectory of this weather system and controlling the intensity of it. We're effectively running simulations here and manipulating the environment almost from like a video game you know civilization type of uh, perspective trying to understand the impact of the weather onto the property damage the correlation of the severity of the weather to the cost of the property damage um, modeling that out so allowing all, in all of these experiences users are able to interact in real time with this data filter it manipulate it, um, you know, whether that be moving through time or some other filter, it's always interactive. And I think that's a really important part of, of any sort of design in immersive spaces with data is to have that interactivity to it. Right. Um, and by the way, we we cut we cut short, and I I saw I saw you, Jad, kind of like uh, <laughs> struggling because yeah. indeed in ten seconds, oh here's this and here's this, and that's I think in a way a statement to the kind of like uh, uh, project that you work on, and I really encourage everybody uh, that that is interested in this topic to actually reach out to to the Bad VR team and to and to learn more, see more of this case study. In this case here, I was just a bit forced to show bits and pieces yeah. of kind of things. So apologies, guys, if we didn't go through the whole flow. But we are certainly going to look more into that weather, uh, weather visualization part, right? And uh, I've seen, by the way, uh, some great comment. It, that looks amazing. Uh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, and um, and uh, so one question that I had is um, also, so we need all these challenges, right? We kind of like stumble upon each other when uh, we we learned that you were actually using shapes uh, XR, and we are a big fan of indeed designing in in VR for VR, right? For these technologies, because that's the way. When actually just said you can use your drawing in three D, uh, then it's like okay, how do you actually do it, right? Uh, so maybe one question is. How did you guys, uh, at a high level, like how did shapes, shapes help you to to tackle those challenges? Yeah, I can maybe take that for a second. Um, like like everybody said, the um, 
the data is inherently 3D, and um, so when we're when we're trying to design, it gets really difficult to design for three-dimensional data in a two-dimensional plane. We kind of need that extra dimension to see things through a little more because some things they look like they're going to work on paper and they just they don't in in 3d and then we can stuck in the in the ways of you know the the old ways of designing for 2d panels and and like flat screens and uh those kind of interactions they're really easy to design and that's what we learn you know in school and that's how we that's how we that's how we think in in the modern age but that's we're not building phone applications or, or or things that interact with 2d screens we're building spatial applications and experiences in a three-dimensional realm and so we need to be able to um be able to fit artists into that 3d space to make sure that we um keep the user's perspective in mind and uh build for the user to be inside of the the world itself right so now i'm i'm sorry i just want to step back because i've got this question basically asked three times in different ways so i think it i think i, I want to bring it to you uh, and that is the question was started with mr was the mr horse actually asked uh can this integrate with data set from salesforce and uh, right after a little bit there is a new question from jared that says well spatial data are the only one benefit from vr the biggest data sets in my company include sales logistic customer retention is another example of course a weather data it's something that is inevitably spatial but when we look at other form of data that per se don't exist don't relate to space do you have experience with that have you uh, yes can you tell yeah. us about that yeah definitely so we have geospatial as well as non-geospatial data that's supported within our environments. And I think that it, there's a large benefit for both. Uh, different benefits for different types of data sets, of course. But when you're looking at non-geospatially tied data, um, with stuff that's more abstract, um, we definitely do display that. And we actually display it some of that data in the data stadium concept that I was talking about before. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of benefits. The main one being is that, you know, instead of having to, you know, lose that greater context, you're always able to have the greater context as you drill down into the data and you're able to see, right. you know, those greater patterns as well as the individual data points or the subsection data points or the group data points as well. Um, Jed maybe can speak yeah. a little more to that too. I mean, think about that LinkedIn example from earlier. You could express that as a tree. You could express that as uh, you know, as as depth or height or width or all of the above, there are many different ways that you could look at that type of information that is not inherently spatial in any way. So when you're talking about data that relates to people, that's where this concept of the data stadium yeah. is, is. What's a better, what's a great way to look at hundreds of thousands of people, put them in a way that like in real life where you see hundreds of thousands of people. And that's one of the very few situations where you can actually almost see a hundred thousand faces in at once and then imagine that you said you have this whole stadium of people in front of you said hey everybody who spent more than thousand dollars last month on groceries raise your hand and then you see this sea of people raise their hand and you say okay well everybody from that group who spent uh some money at you know one particular retailer keep your hand raised everybody else lower your hand some people sit down if you haven't spent any money on groceries uh, you know, sit down. And so you start to have, it's almost like this inquisitive process back and forth where you're shaping the behavior of these representations of hundreds of thousands of people or records or units of data or whatever they are. And that's a way to spatialize an inherently non-spatial data set is to find ways where, are you looking for categorization? Are you looking for patterns and trends? Are you looking for clusters? Do you want the people you know, to change the color of their shirt, depending on their answer. And so depending on this criteria, you start to find ways to fit non-spatial data into spatial representation. Right. And I mean, imagine, I mean, I could imagine that also regarding the, the what Susie was saying about keeping the concept, you can also, for example, hover over an area of the data while you still keep the rest. Right. So and that expands and explodes and maybe give you more information that you could remove your hand and then it goes back. So you still have an impression you're not 
zooming in necessarily, right? You're zooming out. <laughs> you know, paint context. You can drill down and perform analysis on subsets in even individual data points without losing that greater context, which is the main problem with 2D data, data visualization now, especially given the size and complexity of most data sets that people are looking at using 2D screens. It's something akin to, you know, looking at a painting, a piece of art in a two inch by two inch square. You know, if you have a, you know, a piece of art that's the size, you know, the size of a massive wall, like say four foot by four foot, but you're only ever able to ingest that piece of art in two inch by two inch squares, it would be really, really hard to understand what the actual piece of art right. is because you'd have to stitch together all these little pieces in your head because you're never able to actually be able to step back and look in the entire photo or painting or image, um, you know, in, in its entire context. And essentially with VR, that's what we're doing with data. On 2D your screens, you're only ever able to look at that two inch by two inch square. And yeah, you can look at, you know, a thousand two inch by two inch squares and piece together an understanding of what the actual greater data set looks like. But with VR, you don't have to do that. You can just put on a headset and see the biggest, or see the greater picture all at once simultaneously, and also be able to look at that two inch by two inch square and larger pieces simultaneously at the same time. So it, it's, it offers a lot of benefits in addition to obviously also being able to just look at more data just from a pure like volume standpoint. Right, right, right. Look, I, I just wanted to step there because I think it makes a lot of sense. And right now we see also, for example, some uh, like there is all about the metaverse and people are curious. And I think one one thing that everybody has is data almost nowadays, right? right. It doesn't matter what shapes or form. And usually what they do is that they always kind of like fall back into marketing, right? That's the thing. I mean, you go there and what's what do we do? OK, hey, maybe we can build a virtual space for you. Well cool <laughs> the point is how you're gonna use it uh, right. what kind of benefit what kind of return would you get now i'm pretty sure that a bank or an insurance company that is asking those questions and maybe build their own showroom in a the metaverse they might as well benefit more from a way to actually display digest and in general like explore the information that they currently have in a way that really helps them to make better decisions so yeah. I think it's maybe a lesson for everybody that's listening. Maybe when you start this conversation, go to the guys at VR. So look, we have a lot of data. What can we do with it? Can we do? Can we leverage them better than what we are doing currently? And I suppose that they would be more than happy to uh, to help you and tackle uh, another challenge. Definitely. So why don't we now maybe hop? A little bit in VR so that you show uh Jet and Enoch what is that you drew, uh what was some of the thinking process. And as good practice, we always like to do some uh, fun streaming experiment. And I have to say, with uh we actually significant success so far, things never broke. So let's try to see if we can keep the Fingers positive <laughs> <laughs> the positive streak. So let me now go in. And uh, go in, and you guys have the space number, correct? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. good. I am being ready to share. Uh, here we go. Almost. Mm -hmm. We're working on it right now. I guess you're ready. Anok in. I'm going to start sharing. Cast. Right. Casting should be ongoing. And then I can share it with you guys. Here we go. Uh, we are live, I think. Here we go. So let me mute. Let everybody mute themselves, me included. I am now muted. And Jad, can you also mute yourself in shapes? He's doing it now. Where on your left controller, there is a mute button. So I think it's. Yeah. There we go. There we go. I see the mouth disappearing. So, Enoch, here we are in this very, very sketchy place, right? I see here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, 
and that's the way I love it, by the way. I mean, I see some some hand-drawn sketch that you guys have imported in and a lot of little experiment floating in space. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about what what is that you were trying that you were doing together with, with Jad and maybe uh, with other members of the team? Yeah, so we like to we like to take a whiteboard and just um kind of brainstorm some ideas and uh with the requirements we take the ideas and we put them on the whiteboard but we um we we try to keep it in 2d so long as the brainstorm session re produces like words and and descriptions but when it pr produces more um like designs we want to kind of move in as mm -hmm. soon as possible because that's where we get the most value at at seeing uh, these designs played out in a spatial level, so where we can kind of zoom in and put ourselves in the user's perspective, and then we can um, have you know we can have these. It's kind of scattered all over the place, but we can brainstorm some ideas that we see over here. Like, what if we had um, panels over here and we had uh this this button what kind of icons would we want to use and where's the placement of everything and is it is it going to feel right um and then right. and i do have a up. question actually usually yeah. we see kind of like interfaces that tends to be like uh like a one line so maybe i can also share here you see here for example in this oculus now you guys don't see it but there is one panel that you can use and while well, you guys took a slightly different approach because you have as you are here, you have kind of like the user that can, let me just scale a little bit myself. So it can go right, can go right and left. So the UI is split in, in two parts. Was there a specific reason for that? Absolutely, yeah. So this is this is another um, kind of testament to, to putting things in VR and, and testing them out, is we found that when we had that, that bar across user, um, it separated the user away from the data itself so it had both uh, uh severed the connection between the two but also it, it severed the visual connection as well so in order to kind of remedy that we chose to kind of split it split the view and let the view of the data be front and center keep the connection between the two and uh we were able to kind of make sure that we could place it and keep we have to keep ergonomics and usability in mind when when developing these so we tilt them slightly and, and move them away and see if we kind of reach out are they within arm's reach and we see well the arm's reach is going to change as we move our hands further back so we want to we want to follow that curve but we also don't want to obstruct the view from the user right 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 because it technically interferes with what's next yeah susan yeah, trying to mimic a physical control surface, mm -hmm. uh, since our focus is hand tracking. So it's yeah, similar. that's a that's a key component. So that that will make th this will make a lot more sense when you realize that we avoid ranged input. So this whole laser beam, you know, right. that we we avoid that in general for these types of uh, interfaces that we build. Yeah. So everything is within hands reach and because everything hands. is hands yeah. tracking or hand you know. Right at actuation with fingers and buttons and that kind of thing. So that's why you're going to see things being closer, closer to the hands, matching the arc of the joints of the muscles of the hands. So there's almost some right. physiology that goes into it with, you know, what what is the most or the least amount of energy that can be expended by the arms and the hands to be able to interact with user interface. It's it's akin to, you know, how do you have the fewest number of clicks to get right. to through a shopping cart, for example. Right, right. And I also see here there are some maps. And I think there was a next stage here where there is a lot of experimenting here. I'm now on stage two because so maybe for people that are watching, we have a set of stages that represent in this case kind of like layer of experimentation. So here instead, it's more like since indeed where the data are located in its space and time and being able to to control that that is also part of the um let's say part of the challenge so i've seen here you guys experimented with different options maybe why don't you tell us a little bit what was this about and what did you guys try yeah so again we wanted to kind of move away from the traditional um 2d you know 2d flat screen panels because that's we're not dealing with a, a phone. So you can see here, we have 
you know, right. the, the clearest calendar. way. Yes. What's that? Uh, a calendar. I mean, that's that's where where we now on yeah. our phone we pick a date. Then, uh, and the clearest yeah. way to you know find a date would be to have this kind of calendar uh, operation. But that's <laughs> more of like a, a a phone UI system, and this right. is just going to be a lot of buttons, and the interaction is maybe not going to be so great in this virtual space. So we were trying to think how could we have this be a little more spatial, and so we we moved on to these other designs to maybe like, well, maybe we have three rings, one controlling the, the year and one controlling the month and one controlling the day. And so we right. put these in there, we have these ideas and then we almost mock try them out. We, we test them out and play with them and see, all right, well, will this work? Is this, is this going to be usable? And can I get to where I'm going using that? And then, you know, maybe we could have a mix between the two, like, Maybe we do have buttons, but it's it's just we mix the dial options to where the dials are along this way, and you just move the buttons to affect the dials. Right, um, right. So you basically kind of like bring this, and then the data actually do like yeah, this. Yeah, you can see the the visual representation right. of the data moving like that. <laughs> but then we thought, well, we're in you know, we're in three dimensions, how can we use that a little more? So we came up with some of these, like what if we had, that's a little more like a, uh, a little more like a, a drive shaft and where we, uh, you know, we select it and we move it, you know, we want to go forward in time or maybe we want to go backwards. And so we're, we're taking oh, this and okay. we're like a steering wheel, like a, let's say, yeah, for, for the gear, right? Yeah. 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 yeah like a gear shift. Um, okay. and <laughs> And then we we moved from that to be like, well, maybe it's it's less of a gear shift and more like a, a shuffleboard where you move it to the right spot. Right. And then oh, from that's there, what, we... that's what this is. That's what this is. Yeah, so this... exactly. So it would be paused in the middle and we could move it out. Mm, um, right. And so we, we try to we sketch them out and then we try to build them and see if they work. And, and this just kind of wasn't working. It's so but it, it spawned the idea of having something that's a little more like a uh, like a rewind vcr player so mm -hmm. you you move it here and it'll rewind a little bit and then maybe you move it over here and it rewinds you know super fast you can see the numbers changing very fast and then you you let go and it snaps back and you you stop right so right. you know trying to trying to see well this is is maybe more simple to use but it's maybe a little less spatial where as this shuffleboard is is more spatial but it's a little more complex and the yeah. user can maybe get lost in. So these are the kind we see when experimenting in in 3D space, and we can kind of see what will work and what won't. And we can take this in and and show the team and and pitch them and show them, you know, it working and and kind of mock show it. Right. And we can ask these questions like, will will it be a push? Will it be a pinch? Will it go up? You know, 30 days, five days. These are the kind of questions that we can just um, ask and 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 Absolutely, and I mean, I think it's still interesting. Okay, there is, there should still be a early in the design room for experiment and for trying something new, whether that being some crazy idea or a shuffleboard. And then I think there should be always the space to say, well, this is not really working. I mean, do you really expect to do some shuffleboard? Nah, it doesn't feel right. But at least you do have the room for for uh, experimenting right early on, and you don't get attached to maybe a design and you say, okay, look. You know, guys, let's just go for the for the for the calendar on your phone. Familiar, yeah. yeah, but how handy it is to do that in VR? That's another question. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and we don't have to, you know, spend time doing these um, expensive prototypes when we can just put it in here and, and see if it'll work um, with these interactions. And we can take these hands and and see how they're going to do it. And we can zoom ourselves in as close as the user and and see what it feels like to be the user in that. Yeah, right. And uh, like you can also kind of like mock up those those sort of like interaction and show like puppeteer how things would work uh, in in space technically. To yeah, we can feel. take take yeah. blocks and and um, hidden behind, and we can mock press buttons and and pull them from behind and and move them closer. Let's to do it. Show. Let's do it. Push the events. Yeah. Whoop events. Whoop. Here we go. Whoop, Push whoop. it whoop. out. <laughs> yeah, and so we can have that kind of mock interaction uh, yes. puppeteering to help our idea, our ideas kind of flow better 
in right, this right. 3D space. And this is basically how that UI that you were showing before, that is in that the, the core UI actually uh, evolved, right? So that was the, the initial sketch that maybe we can quickly go back to. I can go. So this was the initial sketch with some icons. Then when you go here, it's like a more refined visual showing indeed like positioning, what were the function, what were the things. And as you see here, you, got, you are exp experimenting also with the 3D icons, for example, uh, as part of your discovery, let's say. Yeah, and and more things can come out with that as we as we kind of mock um, go through and we we see okay well maybe these I touch this and it it maybe you know maybe it appears in my hand and then I can use it. Right. Well, what if I'm coming through this? We have to have some some blocks here. So as you're like mock interaction, doing these kind of interactions, you can see where certain problem areas may come up uh, with this. And then we can see, you know, obviously, does it work? Does it not work? Um, maybe we should switch back to th this way of doing it. Um, right. right, right, indeed. I mean, and again, it's you can test it for yourself. You can be here, you can scale yourself at the scale of the UI, and then you, you can just have that conversation early on. That is, and then at the stage three, we do have basically like a, a bit of this impression where we say the, the city and the different like sub venue uh how will they show up uh and uh and then indeed i mean we um, we can now maybe like go back and i can show you the clip of how actually these are actually function and some of uh of uh of your process of the people and i mean it does look very very close to this uh the the final uh, the, the final one that that at least i've seen correct yes Yes, it do, it ended up the the final design ended up very similar to the design that you're in currently. Yeah. So well, I mean, let's let's go out and let's get show that video, and we can keep getting questions. Um, so and while we do this transition, uh, I do have questions that I haven't addressed. How are you starting to look at hand tracking instead of controllers? If not, why? Yes. Yeah, we're looking primarily at hand tracking. Yeah. So we are we are mostly getting rid of controllers for our user interfaces. Um, They're and, just bulky and not as user friendly. We find that just natural hand gestures, it's just so much easier, especially for people who aren't as familiar with AR and VR technology to just be able to tell them, put on a headset, use your hands, just touch it as if it were real. It's just we find that to be so much more intuitive and easy for people to understand than having to sort of teach them how to use controllers. There are certain instances where, you know, a special controller works really well, but most of the time we really just focus on designing for hand tracking. Yeah, and, and uh, with, it, it should be noted though that certain applications are more appropriate for controllers. So right. something like a drawing application, highly, highly appropriate to use controllers. Absolutely. It's just that we are not doing drawing. So for us, right. it's a lot of sort of you know, selecting something or or sliding something up and down or, or sort of twisting something with your hands. Controllers aren't appropriate for that type of a user for that type of use. But for something like 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 shapes, we couldn't imagine it any other way than how it's no. Done. There is too much stuff going on, right? Well, Wait. instead, if if you do have this and this and a slider, that's okay. You don't have shift, hold, grab. It would be too much. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yes. I very much uh, the application. That's true. So I do have questions. First, I want to ad address one uh, question from Adrian. It says, great stuff, although mixed reality would be the best use case. I think you guys are certainly works on mixed reality. And maybe I can also start sharing one little quick thing, uh, maybe to get people uh, imagination, not imagination, but my like uh, to give people... Um, let yeah, me. definitely. I mean, there. I, I believe it depends on the data set that you're looking at. Some data sets are great for VR and some are really, really good for, for mixed reality and AR. Um, we have a product called C-Signal that visualizes the RF, spe RF spectrum overlaid on your environment. So basically like putting on a headset and having X-ray goggles into your Wi-Fi, cellular and Bluetooth networks. So you can actually yeah. see those networks for the first time you know, contextual to your environment. You're looking at real data in your environment um, and you can make changes to it, interact with it, um, you know, and see how that propagates throughout real space. So definitely in a use case like that and with that sort of data set, 
absolutely um, AR or mixed reality would be a much better way of looking at it. And, you know, depending upon what you're doing with weather data could also really be strong with weather data too. Um, and any sort of geospatial data, but um, collaboration, collaboration. Yeah. That's another really good one. You want to see it look in somebody's eyes while yeah. you're manipulating uh, holograms, then right. you might want to have AR. And, and I think in that case, we, we, we also got you covered because I do have one little thing to share with people right now. So as you have seen, uh, this is a, this was the initial concept. Uh, but what we believe we need that mixed reality and those experiences are going to be really the, the future. So that's why we enable the, the pass-through mode. So in this case, what you see here is basically a glimpse of my room with data floating around. So no. that is the moment where the design actually starts living in space right and you could think well this should be maybe be there because i want to go with my desk leave my controllers turn and maybe touch it right and, and maybe start interacting and start feeling how 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 those that are going to be positioned uh in space so this is a bit of some of the things we are also experimenting to help people like creatives and, and, and studios at, uh, at Bed VR to actually uh, create for this, for this new medium. So I'm now, there is a little bit of a delay, but I think I'm doing a lot of things at the same time. So let's, let's stop sharing here, close this up <laughs> and get back. So Adrian, indeed, uh, mixed reality is, and indeed the guys at Bed VR are certainly uh, doing that as part where it does make sense. And we as shapes love to support like people at Bed VR or other people that are creating that kind of content. Uh, so, and um, th there are more questions, and I have to disappoint some people because we will not have the time to answer them all. Uh, <laughs> but at least David mentioned really great stuff. Uh, I'd see we are seeing the beginning of the future of data visualization. Good point. That's why you should start now, not when it's too late. Um, Absolutely. Uh, there is the one interesting question from John, and then he's asking, how close are we to AI-assisted voice command for action like increment year to 2023? Absolutely valid point, right? Uh, so besides, if, we, if we neglect the second part of the question, that would be <laughs> really relevant, but nonetheless. So how do you see that kind of like voice control of, of some of that? Yeah, that speaks to user input and yeah. the control that you have over the system. Your voice is an input also. And when you, you start bringing AI to the picture where you can have conversational voice as an input, where you are commanding the system to reorganize itself using a, a natural language or natural conversation like, show me this for this year, that historically is very difficult to instruct a computer to do, easy to instruct a person to do, so if you had a data analyst sitting there operating all the, you know, the charts and graphs and the traditional approach, you could say, hey, show me the data for 2023 or 2022 or, or 2019. And so that would be something that you would have to pass through a person. They have to figure out, well, how do I interpret what you're saying? But when you start getting into the next generation of all of this, you have your, your AI, your digital assistant, that person, that virtual person can interpret what it is that you're saying, use it to swap out different dimensions or control variables in the display of the data. So the short answer is yes, that's coming. That's coming sooner than you might think. And uh, uh, it's not something that we're in any way officially announcing or anything like that, but yeah, that's definitely on the roadmap. It's on, yeah, it's definitely something that we're aware of and that we would like to do when it is something that is user-friendly um, for everybody. And also I have to mention this because it happens to me all the time. Uh, female voices and AI that exist today really hard. So, and, I mean, maybe it's just my female voice, but I've had this happen with a lot of my friends as well. Um, you know, different voices, especially ones that are, are female, they sometimes have a hard time with it. So once that technology is a little bit better uh, for everyone, then it probably. And, not. and I think it's it's very delicate because you might also so you put in the hands of someone else the 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 filtering and the understanding. Yeah. And that is with data, it's very dangerous because I mean, it, you, you you can 
with a very little tweak, you can obtain very different results or, or show very different results. So interpretation of data is one thing, then what you visualize, I can go so can go very wrong. <laughs> I can see yeah. that happening. Definitely. You want to take the judgment, leave the judgment to the human being involved. So we want to make the AI following instructions, following commands, but not making judgments about, well, right. I'm going to hide half the data because I think you're trying to look at this other half. No, 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 no. The human being needs to make that assertion, or that determination, not the machine. Right. Okay, so we have a problem. Uh, and the problem is that there are a lot of questions. And uh, guys, do you have? Can, can you stay ten more minutes? Because I, I, I will. We, we can cover a few more because it's, it's a shame. One, one being that. Uh, so when will there be a consumer release of this app, or is this strictly enterprise for now? So okay, it depends. Ships XR right now, you can get it on the store. <laughs> Right, and if you are specifically interested and you have a project that is related with this mixed reality that you have just seen, you can reach out to me and then we can talk about it and we can give you access because it's not available for everyone. On the other hand, for the bad VR side, for that data visualization that we have been talking about, I'm not sure uh, what is the status, for example, of uh, of that weather visualization. Is, is that a, a project you're doing for a client? Uh, how, how is that, when is that going to be available to user for the weather visualization specifically there is going to be a consumer release of that it's later this year so if you're interested in getting an early peek at that just reach out and we'd be happy to to get you in on the effectively the beta testing of it early on uh, our email is info at badvr.com yeah so our website whatever just just however you can get a hold of us get a hold of us and we can sort of show you where that the, the path for that and the schedule for that and maybe people start dropping out because, of course, we are at the end of the hour. Whoever wants to stay is more than welcome to pick a few questions. The other point is uh, that VR, they're hiring. So go on their website and check out because, I mean, you've seen the amazing work they've been doing. And uh, it's really a pleasure, actually, to, to be part. And so go ahead, check the website because they're hiring for a different position. Maybe, guys, who, who, who are you looking for right now? Well, we're looking for UX UI designers, actually. So if anyone is inspired by this this webinar, definitely looking for you. Um, and in addition to that, looking for uh, C Sharp developers, um, Unity developers, um, looking for just a general web developer right now. So mainly engineers and uh, designers as well. Perfect, perfect. So if you are there, if you're looking for, for, for a new challenge, it really designing spatial experiences, right? Because what happens is also, to be honest, I see often designers or the engineer, they end up in this, in, in, they are in enterprise. There isn't a lot of room for, for, for innovation. You're really often kind of like stuck to the traditional way and we go, okay, look, if it works, it's fine. And of course, it does work. Now, what kind of experience the final user gets? It's a totally different story. Is right. that going to commission a new project? But this is a different story. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, one question from Bas is, what industry would you love to break into? Oh, that's it. We've always liked education. Yeah, education's a good one. Just mm -hmm. because it's all about that sharing of knowledge. And, and again, our mission of making just data more accessible to everybody, yeah. um, technical and non-technical. You know, it shouldn't just be data scientists who get to play with data all day. It should be everybody else also. So I think education is one space that we're not, we don't really come from that world but we've always been interested in how do we share the, the sort of fruits of all this work with everybody. I also think it's uh, the, the medical industry is a really strong one that would be great for this. Um, it just is not an industry, again, that we have a ton of experience in, and there's just a high barrier of entry into that industry as well. But I do think eventually there's a huge opportunity there too. Yeah, and this connects very well with the question from Pamela. Uh, what is your next challenge? Uh, and how you support each other as a team and the advantage of working so closely together. So one, I would say that it's like one is more of a team questions and yeah. the other, it might be interpreted in many ways. So one is an open-ended, what is your challenge? And the other is how do you guys support each other in, in, in working together? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think I can talk a little bit to how to support each other as the team. Um, really just try it. We're all, just to be clear, all remote and distributed. So just trying to make sure that we maintain communication um, and constantly checking in with each other and also understanding 
you know, very clear boundaries of when, who's working when and what hours. And, you know, that really also helps support each other too, in a weird way, setting those boundaries of knowing when to engage, when not to engage. But I think being able to all come together in something like a shapes environment that does sort of simulate being physically together in a meeting space helps a lot, you know? And I think sometimes we forget because we're all so used to remote working now, the value of that physical togetherness. Um, we do have an office here in LA, so we do get together with, you know, local LA team members, but we do have team members, you know, as Enoch you know, is an example that- Missouri. Missouri, <laughs> right. So, so having a, a virtual space that we're all getting together and not just Zoom, but like a physical, like a feeling of physical presence next to another team member really does help build that camaraderie and togetherness. Um, and then uh, I believe the second part of the question was something about, I, I actually, I don't so what is our next challenge? What's our next challenge? Yeah, here is it, oh, by bringing it back. Yeah, so I'll talk about the advantages of working so closely together, um, really just being able to uh, share the same vision and make sure that we're all sort of building towards the same future together. Um, having that shared vision and the shared motivation for where we're going is really important. Um, and that comes from working closely together. Um, in terms of our next challenge, I think, you know, just really bringing all of this work that we've done, all this R&D work, bringing it to market, really sharing it with the world, really operationalizing it and having our technology really start solving public challenges for people and sharing those testimonials, sharing the value out of what we've done, I think is a big challenge. I don't think it's going to, you know, be something that we fail at, but it's definitely going to be a challenge, you know? So I look forward to that challenge and I look forward to meeting it as well. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's all, it's great to have you here and in general, you guys sharing this story because I really think that there is uh, a lot of values and, and experience in that. And also chipping in on what you mentioned about feeling connected, uh, like even before there was so much, so often they would say, hey, come over and check over my shoulder what I'm doing and how that works out. Well, that's not really the case. Uh, and of course, in, in, in the way where we are all distributed and there is going to be we're going to be that's going to happen just more often right? right because in order to get talent you need to be more open because of course now people are used to a certain way of working so those those restriction in a way have to get loose and but then how do you can still do work because that's another point people think oh yeah let's have a meeting in VR. sure you can go in work room you can go in group you can go in spatial you can go but then what do you do after one two times you have been there and you have attached post-it on a wall or something like that then it's it's certainly limited and that's why we really want to, you know, empower and facilitate actually do work, do design work, do thinking work, ideation work, and in in that virtual environment. And that's true. We don't have avatar because you're doing work, right? Because because you are connecting, you are providing value to each other, and that's the reason. Yeah, are you thinking of adding avatar? I'm not sure any soon because what is the purpose of being there in that moment? You would just see hands and faces and facial expression calculated. Right. That's like, <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Right. Yeah. We like to move away from the, um, like the PowerPoint presentations of our, our designs and just jump straight into shapes. That way, if anybody says, well, Hey, that, that doesn't work. What if we do it this way? They can, they have the tools at the ready instantly create it and say, let's, let's move this over here and let's do it this way. And then it, it becomes way more productive as a meeting just with the yeah. tools at the ready. Indeed. Everything. And, and yeah, feel right. please and stop. Everything becomes interactive at that point, all of the designs, all of the work, all of the collab, everything becomes a multi-user collaborative experience. Even a presentation like Enoch is talking about, even that becomes completely interactive and we can do all the what ifs in the moment using those tools. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, I really wanted to thank you. And uh, I think people are, uh, Pamela, thanks for answering my question. Of course. Thank you. Guys and Pamela, but of course with anybody actually uh, who tuned in and actually sh share your questions and, and stay with us for this uh, very packed hour, I have to say. So thanks everybody. Uh, and again, are you looking for a new challenge? Well, Bad VR it's a great place to to start with. So go at info at shape uh, at badvr.com. Correct. Absolutely. And, and course, if you go to badvr.com, our website, you can see the job openings and you can apply. Or if you would like to reach out to me directly, Suzanne at badvr.com as well. Awesome. And uh, guys, it was a pleasure to uh, to have you here. 
I've learned a lot. And one thing that I'm going to take away is that, I mean, actually, data were not born on a 2D surface. So while we are sticking with <laughs> with, with showing on a 2D surface, it's, I've never thought about it in that perspective. So guys, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, I think that guys are thanking for, for, the, for the conversation and, uh, and really, really glad that you guys. Thanks for are, attending, are... asking such great questions. It, it's been wonderful, really wonderful. Amazing, guys. So thank you very much. And of course, if you want to prototype, create, and meet with others to design your own data experiences or whatever other immersive concept that maybe you want to pitch to your manager, you want to pitch to leadership, to a client, go on ShapeSexR. It's completely free. And, and then you can try it out and get together with your team to actually uh, deliver great results like the one you've seen from Bad VR. So guys, thank you very much. Highly recommended. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. You. Bye. Have a good one.